as I said before, welcome. My name is James Bonilla. I see some familiar faces. Johan, welcome back. Maxine, welcome back. I see uh, this is really cool. This is really gratifying uh, to see you guys. I mean, coming in again and again and, and, and trying to share with us and, and learn together. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how to develop speaking skills online and error correction when it comes to speaking skills. Okay. Now, the fundamentals remain pretty much the same. Um, when we think about developing speaking skills online, it's, it's not so different from developing skills online. In essence, uh, what helps students get better at speaking online is the same as what helps them get better at speaking offline. So there needs to be comprehensible input. In other words, students need to be able to understand uh, the instructors clearly. The most important thing, I guess, is they have to be motivated to speak, which is the hardest part, um, especially with younger students. Trying to get them to speak is, is quite an ordeal. And most importantly, the students need to be engaged. Now, just as with any other activity in an ELT environment or TEFL class, so to speak, you need to go from, again, the same sequence that we always do. You need to have a warm up, which should be a nice, you know, I mean, game to get them started, to get into the mood. If you're going to work with a simple past or present perfect or whatnot, try not to make your warm up a grammar warm up. Uh, a lot of teachers told me, well, I, I like to make my warm up a review of the prior class. Uh, this can be a little bit stressful. I prefer just to have some simple game, something easy, something like, like, like we discussed in past webinars, uh, Simon Says, uh, Charades, Pictionary, etc. Or maybe, um, you know, if the students are intermediate or, or, or advanced, then we'll discuss this further down the webinar today. Uh, maybe you can use some illustrations to elicit a response. Maybe you can show them a small video and, and ask them what they see. Uh, and this will get them, you know, into the mood. Then we have the introduction, as we always do, with the class objective for the day. The presentation. Uh, I cannot stress this enough. Uh, when you do the presentation of whatever grammar, you know, structures you're going to use, make sure that your presentation is done in context. We always said this. Um, if, if you're going to work the simple past, tell them a short story, an anecdote, uh, something that they will find interesting. Uh, sometimes based on the response that you get from the picture prompt uh, in the warm up, you can get an idea of what kind of mood they're in on that day. And as we said before, as you get to know your students, you get to know what, what makes them tick, what, what interests them. So make sure that when you do your presentation, um, it's something engaging, something that will not bore them to death, okay? Then when you get into the actual class and you go into the, go into the actual practice stage, when it comes to speaking, it follows the same rules as any other practice activity, uh, whether it be writing class or grammar class, you still need to go from structure to semi-structure to unstructured. So what you want to do is you want to have some sort of a dialogue for them to simply read with each other and practice. Then you want to have something that will require them to fill in the blanks. Let's say the conversation is, uh, so what are you having for lunch? Well, today I'm having a, a fruit salad, just a fruit salad. What are you having for lunch? Um, I'm having a hamburger and fries and a milkshake, but that's not really healthy, is it? And then, you know, after they practice the conversation, you can change, ask them to change, you know, hamburger, milkshake for whatever food and, and fruit salad for some other food. In other words, to basically replace the existing vocabulary, okay? All right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry, before we get there. So the most important thing also is to know how to handle large groups. Now, when you have a one-on-one -on -one online class, or maybe you have two students, nah, it's fairly easy, right? But what happens when you have 10 students online? What happens when you have 20 students online? Now. There's a cool feature in Zoom, um, and I think it's also available on Microsoft Teams. I don't know about Google Hangouts or Skype, but there's a cool feature in Zoom called Rooms. 
You know how in, in, in a face-to-face -face classroom, you want to really empower, you know, speaking and interaction. A communicative approach bases itself on communication or basically production through interaction. So that means that you need to split up your group and have them in smaller little groups. In a classroom, it's pretty easy because you simply, you know, gather them around, you know, in different tables, and then you sort of like hover, yes, from table to table, right? To get them to, a, you know, produce and, 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 and have a student-centered class. Well, here we can do it as well. Further down the presentation, I'm going to show you an instructive on how in Zoom you can actually create rooms. And then these rooms will be isolated from each other uh, and from the main presentation. And you can actually sort of like go into each room and interact with the students and, and sort of like, um, you know, I mean, do a follow up and, 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 and support your students as they go through these activities, right? Okay, okay. All right. Sydney, welcome. Great to see you again, my friend. I'm just browsing here very quickly to see who's back. Natalie, Natalie Burrows, how are you? Welcome back. It's really great, really great to have you guys back, okay? All right. So, like trying to connect here. All right. Okay. But before we get into all of that, um, I think that the most important thing that we need to do is we need to learn how to tackle the technology. And what do I mean by tackling the technology? The most intimidating thing for a teacher uh, who's not experienced teaching online or, or for many of us who are basically experiencing this for, for the first time, um, the technology can be quite overwhelming. I mean, uh, do I know the latest features from Google Hangouts? My students want to meet on Teams. I don't know how to use this you know, application too well. Um, I've always used Skype. Why do I have to use Zoom? Well, this is added pressure to what's already a stressful situation, okay? And, and, and it's all this barrage of uh, tech tips that we keep getting from everybody. And, and sometimes we feel guilty because we haven't watched the latest webinar of integrating Google Docs into our virtual classrooms, or we haven't read up on the 17 things teachers must start doing with Quizlet. Um, so it's a, time, it's a time, time like this when, when you need to remember that good enough is good enough, okay? Don't overcomplicate yourself. You, you don't need to have all the latest ways and gadgets. Um, we went through this. You want your students to be able to hear you clearly. You want to be able to hear your students clearly. Um, it's always helpful to record you know, the sessions, especially when students are speaking. And later on, we'll see why. Uh, that's a feature that's already added into Zoom. Uh, for example, that's how we get these webinars recorded. And by the way, um, before I forget, the webinars are being uploaded and I'll ask the commercial director to send you guys the instructions on how to access all the past webinars uh, to your emails, okay? Because I know this is going to be a question at, at the end of the webinar. And I, I did not forget, I did ask, all right? Okay, so whether you're using Skype or, or you're using Zoom, just stick to the basics, okay? Don't let technical issues get in the way. Um, what is important, however, is, and, and I was having this um, conversation with a teacher friend of mine yesterday, and he told me, well, you know, I have my first class on Zoom today. Um, can you help me out? I said, sure, let's, let's connect. And I noticed that he was not wearing a headset, and, and the sound was a little bit sketchy, to say the least, like, like breaking up. And I told him, dude, you're breaking up. Uh, well, what time is your class? He said, well, my class is in about three hours. I said, well, can you go out today? He says, yes, I can go out today. I said, well, go borrow, you know, a headset or, or go buy a headset or for your next class have a headset because it's fundamental. And lo and behold, he said, no, I don't want to spend money on that. You know, my computer microphone is not this and that. And later on, he called me and told me his class had been a disaster because his students could not understand what he was saying. So, very important. I mean, this is intimidating for you. It's intimidating for students. Hard enough to get them to, to speak, you know, face to face. Now, to get them to speak online um, and then to make matters worse. I mean, your voice is not clear and the, the technology is, is basically not working. So, again, stable internet connection and a good headset. Okay. 
camera, not so important if we're talking about speaking skills. A good headset, fundamental. Now, there are some advantages uh, of technology, however. Um, we had spoken about this before, and we said, yeah, well, there are some, you know, I mean, advantages and disadvantages, but there are uh, specific aspects in which technology beats face-to-face -face speaking classes. So one way in which teaching online can literally, I mean, surpass or beat face-to-face -face lessons is that it is more easily recorded. That's plain and simple. I just said it before. And this can mean that the whole lesson is available to all participants afterwards, uh, just like these webinars. So in a face-to-face -face environment, uh, students can't really hear themselves except for the feedback that you give them or the corrections that you do on their pronunciation. With technology, the huge advantage is that sessions can be recorded. Yes, in a face-to-face -face environment, you can do it too, but I've done it and it's very distracting. You know, everybody keeps looking at the camera or everybody's self-conscious that they're being recorded. Yes. Here, students will have the opportunity to listen afterwards, not only to themselves, but also to their peers and to go over the conversations over and over again and, and this creates you know, all these processes of metacognition where students begin to develop their own routes of uh, you know, self-awareness as to what is correct, what am I doing correctly, what am I not doing correctly, and how can I improve my pronunciation. And also, um, many a times, for example, uh, as I see some of you are taking notes and, and, and listening, and that's good, that's very good. But when you take notes, yes, and, and I'm not saying don't do it. I take notes myself all the time. You might miss some portions of the lecture, correct? With technology, you have the great advantage that you can take your notes without any stress, knowing that you can always come back to the recording yes, and catch whatever it is that you might have missed. Yes. Remember that uh, there's a reason why, if you notice in my webinars, I don't put text on my presentations. The brain can only process either reading or listening but not both simultaneously, okay? You can listen and you can write, <clears throat> that's the concept of dictation, but it's more of a mechanical, you know, I mean, um, a mechanical task in which the brain is not really processing the information. It's basically being transferred from, you know, your auditive input into paper. So again, technology can actually uh, really help you. And, and also the, Sometimes in a classroom environment, especially if we don't have a video beam or, or we don't have a, a TV or internet connectivity, resources can be very limited. Well, if the class takes a, a different twist, for example, uh, your students are not engaged in the conversation that you're proposing or the speaking activities that you're proposing, and they're talking about, I don't know, the soccer game or the football game or the baseball game or whatnot, you can very easily adapt and just basically jump on Google and then find material related to what is engaging them, you know, and actually, excuse me a second, and actually, I mean, you know, turn the class around and have a really cool activity, okay? So, yes, technology is intimidating, but technology can actually help you a lot. And <clears throat> the things that, that, that you also need to understand is that this is a tendency, okay? Uh, our current pandemic situation is going to end, yes. The virus will probably be gone um, in a year or two. Uh, the United States has already purchased 300 million vaccines from Oxford University, and we are probably going to have access to this thing by maybe November, December, January, the latest. But life will not change. Uh, life will not go back to what it used to be, especially education-wise. A lot of parents are realizing, a lot of students are realizing that it's much more practical to take your classes in the comfort of your home. You don't have uh, to have a stranger coming to your home. You don't have to go to an English institute. You don't have to go into another place and waste time, you know, commuting or, or traveling. So don't think that this is a temporary fad. This is here to stay. I mean, online classes are something that has been discussed in the past, you know, by many educational institutions. Uh, Harvard University even has a virtual class in something called virtual, uh, virtual life or, or second life, I'm sorry, which is a, a virtual environment. So 
we really need to get, I mean, take advantage of this conjunction of uh, all of this that is happening with the pandemic, get really acquainted, you know, with the resources, and then, you know, make the most of it. Uh, as a private teacher, I have always had the problem of, you know, when I was a high school teacher, that I would leave school and then, you know, I had a private student in, in well, let's see, when I was down in Colombia, yes, I had a private student in the north of the city, and then I had another private student in the south of the city, and then I lived towards the west of the city. So, I mean, I was limited to maybe two private students per day, and I would have to travel, you know, one or two hours per day just to get there and come back and then get home. Here, you can actually maximize your production in the comfort of your home, all right? Another important thing is, and, and this is going to sound silly before I forget. Um, yes, you are in the comfort of your, of your home, but I had teachers who will be nicely dressed from the waist up, right? And then something happens, you know, the baby cried, and then they stand up and they run. And it happens that they're wearing shorts or boxers or something like that. Um, <laughs> get dressed for the job. Yeah, Samantha's laughing and, and, and it's hilarious, isn't it? My wife was actually telling me this morning, why are you getting dressed? I see Michelle smiling too. And we see it on the, I said, well, I'm getting dressed because in case the baby cries, I don't want people seeing my Superman boxers, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's hilarious. However, that would be a topic of conversation for the student. So whichever way you see it, you know, it might be beneficial or not. All right? All right, cool. Now, let's get on to what really interests you guys. And it's which online activities can I use to empower, you know, speaking skills, correct? Now, before we do this, let me activate the computer sound. Ah, I remember what happened to me last time. And now let's get back to the presentation. Now, as I mentioned before, Zoom has a really cool feature in which you can create rooms. I have thought about doing that today with you guys and maybe, you know, I mean, open different rooms and have discussion, but you know, time is a limitation as you guys know it. And I'm just going to show you a short video that I found on YouTube on, on basically how to activate this tool in Zoom. But you can just go to YouTube and simply type in, you know, how to activate, you know, rooms in Zoom. And you get very thorough, you know, tutorials. And I've already tried it, you know, yesterday before um, doing this webinar, I called a whole bunch of friends. They were really upset at me, you know, Friday night. I'm calling everybody, guys, please bear with me. And I practiced with the rooms feature and it was super cool because as Napoleon said, you know, divide and conquer. And, and this is what always works in a real class environment, all right? So let's take a look at this short video. Uh, please give me a thumbs up if you hear the sound of the video okay, all right? Hey everyone, Farah from Zoom here. On this brief video, we're gonna show you how you can leverage our breakout room feature to take a large meeting or cl virtual classroom and split it up into smaller groups or sessions. You'll see that I have already enabled the breakout room feature, which you can find in your session. Sorry. Settings along sorry, the Sorry, sorry, let's start again, sorry. Hey everyone, Farah from Zoom here. On this brief video, we're gonna show you how you can leverage our breakout room feature to take a large meeting or cl virtual classroom and split it up into smaller groups or sessions. You'll see that I have already enabled the breakout room feature, which you can find in your settings along the bottom. And that breakout room button will actually be right here. Um, this is a button that only your hosts or co-hosts will be able to see. And um, right now we don't have a co-host in the session. If I manage my participants, I can hover over Catherine, for example, to make her a co-host. So she'll see this button now as well. When we're ready to split the group into smaller sessions, I can easily click this button to get a pop-up window asking me how many rooms I'd like to assign out and how many participants per room. Uh, for this example, it's recommending since there are six people, we can split it up into two rooms. I can do this automatically or manually. So if we click on the automatic button, it'll create, it'll generate those breakout rooms for us. Certainly if there's anyone I wanna swap out, maybe I wanna move Michael to the other room, I can exchange him for a different participant. Once I'm ready to open all rooms, I'll click this open all rooms button and our participants will be able to join the sessions that we've created for them. So we'll slowly see those people join. One thing that's really important to note is that as a host or a co-host, 
you can actually hop between the different rooms to talk to the participants. You can see here I have the join button. Now everybody's left to go to the rooms. I can broadcast a message to everybody and say uh, wrapping up in one minute. And this will broadcast the message and then I can close the rooms, which gives them a one minute timer to rejoin our session. We'll give everybody a second to rejoin and I'll show you one or two additional features with breakout rooms. There we go. We can kind of see everybody kind of popping back in. Now everybody's rejoined the main session. You'll see that I have the opportunity to reopen these rooms again, which is really great. If you have a very long session or a very long virtual class, you can split into these uh, virtual smaller groups as often as you'd like. And the additional options here will allow you to automatically close breakout rooms after a specified amount of time. You can also change the countdown timer to be 30 seconds or two minutes if you like. I'll show you a setting where you can also pre-assign folks to be in your breakout room before the classroom starts. You'll want to navigate over to the class that's already been created in your Zoom portal. Under the meetings tab, you can find your meeting. Scrolling all the way to the bottom, you'll see uh, if we open this to re-edit it, I have the opportunity to pre-assign a breakout room here. And I can create the rooms and upload a CSV with all of my participants in advance so that their names are already populated in the room when I start the session. That's basically how you can run breakout rooms. We hope you found this video helpful. If you have any additional questions, please visit us at support.zoom.us. Thanks so much for watching. Take care. All right, so I don't know if you caught that. Uh, support.zoom.org. And I mean, this is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, I guess the, the key is to first get to the settings and figure out how to activate the, the rooms feature because you have to activate it. Uh, you need to be a account administrator. And when you go into the settings, your general Zoom uh, settings meetings, uh, let's take a look at it actually. We do have time. Take a quick look. All right. so. Basically, you Google it, right? And when you go to Zoom, right? Basically, you you can basically look at, look up the information online, and then what features are there? And then you get how to schedule, you know, the meeting rooms. And here in the Zoom Health Center, yes, you have all the instructive. We're not going to go through it, uh, but like I said, basically here it shows you, yeah, how to set up the rooms. And my suggestion to you guys is that before you try this, do what I did. We all have friends, we all have family members, you know what I mean? So if we want to make mistakes, might as well make them with our friends. If you have a basic Zoom account, uh, I don't know if this is available. You may have to pay, you know, for a, a small fee for the full feature Zoom account. But if you're like I always said to my friends, they they tell me, yeah, but you know, Skype is free. I say yes, but you're making money with this. Uh, just use the money that you're saving on transportation to invest, you know, on your tools because this is your transportation. This is your medium. Okay. Uh, I'm not here uh, as, a, as a sponsor for Zoom, by the way. I'm not endorsing Zoom or, or telling you this in any way. I'm just giving you what the options are. Okay? You may want to look into uh, Microsoft Teams, which is free with full features, and see if it, if, if it also has rooms. Uh, honestly, I haven't tried it because I don't use it much. Right? All right, let's get back to the presentation. All right, so as I mentioned before, uh, one of the, the best ways to get your students speaking is to use a picture prompt, okay? I don't know if you can see it clearly, uh, but basically in, in, in most English books, you can find these features. Let's look for one that you know we can see more clearly. Uh, this is one of the many books that I use, and 
before you know I begin a class to get my students into the speaking mode and this is great for a warm-up and to get to know what kind of mood they're in and whatnot I simply ask him what do you see and then I will ask him follow-up questions okay like what do you think is going to happen next or how does this relate to uh, what's going on in the construction industry in your city for example so I'm going to ask maybe Samantha I'm going to ask Johan I'm going to ask Karen and Michelle to unmute yourselves yes I'm, I'm going a little bit with a different format and Natalie borrows too and um, basically make it a little bit more interactive so we're going to start with Natalie what 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 words, uh, can you unmute yourself, please? Okay, Natalie, what comes to mind when you see this illustration? Uh, what is this? What is happening uh, here? Uh, they're planning or they're building or they are planning the next phase of a building or they're checking something. All right, very good. And Karen, uh, what, do you, what do you see? I mean, what, what gets your attention? It doesn't have to be what you see in reference or what's happening. So. Natalie tells us they're planning, very good. So we got some verbs going on here. They're checking, you can also focus on the colors and what you think about, you know, the, the structure itself. Just give me whatever comes to your head spontaneously. Well, it looks like they're building something very big, very red. I don't know, yeah, it could be like red. part of an amusement park or a very big structure. I don't cool. know. Cool, awesome. All right, mm -hmm. and who else do we have? We had Samantha. Yeah, it looks like um, it, they're, they're possibly checking to make sure that that, uh, I think it's scaffolding, um, is done correctly or maybe, uh, you know, they've got the plans in front of them. So mm -hmm. they're like, plans, does this look like what we, what it should? So yeah, checking, checking to see that everything is going according to plan. Okay, so uh, Johan, what do you think these, these men are probably talking about? I think it, <clears throat> pardon. I think it's a project manager speaking to one of the technicians, and they are looking at the plants. They got safety gear on, so I assume it looks like they are in a in a place that is normally unsafe. So they have to wear safety gear. Uh -huh. um, so it's basically a, a follow up <laughs> on how the project develops. The project manager speaking to a technician technician looking at something that's been done uh, with the safety gear uh, fitted to their bodies. All right, I'm going to ask Michelle to jump in here now. Uh, Michelle, what do you think is going to happen next here? Oh, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, well, what I saw when I saw this picture was like an age difference. So one of them looks younger, the other one looks older. So it could that's be some sort of like mentorship or internship going on. Um, he could be learning along the way. Uh, they could take a tour. They're probably in the middle of a tour. And uh, he could be also being given a tour of the location for possible hire in the future. Awesome. All right, guys, so my point is this made. Uh, can we please mute ourselves again? Yeah. So we can continue. Thanks so, thank you so much for uh, helping me out with this. Now, what I found interesting right now, as I always find my students, is that Michelle, Karen, I mean, Johan, you all came up with different things, Samantha, with different things that I saw. As a teacher, I'm just thinking, well, um, yeah, it's some sort of like oil rig. And, and they're probably discussing uh, how the hell are we going to get the next piece up there? But then by listening to you guys, we had, you know, planning, we had different uh, views. Michelle, you know, uh, she, had a, she had a very interesting, you know, outlook that I, I oversaw now that I think about it. Yeah, he could be a mentor, but you get the idea, right? And then, you know, Karen said he's very, was it Karen that said he's very red? So yeah, it jumps at you. So what's cool about it is that if these were to be, you know, a real class, then I would really have an idea of how to, you know, focus the conversation. 
And then I would go probably, I would follow along with, you know, let's talk about, depending on the level of the class, let's talk about your favorite colors. Like in the case of Harry, let's see what, what do colors represent to you? Why red? Um, Johan, I, I would probably, you know, put him in a group of people and start discussing about, you know, how safe is construction nowadays? Uh, he said, he mentioned that it was, it was very unsafe, you know? And then, you know, and so on and so after, I, I would probably ask Michelle, Michelle, who has had this type of, uh, you know, impact in your life? Who, who was your biggest mentor? Uh, or who is the person that you look up to? Now, you see where I'm going with this, right? So by making the subject matter engaging to your reality, now you have given me tools, right, to focus the class more effectively and to get you talking. Because now I can get you talking to stuff that really interests you, to stuff that is really relevant to you. A lot of teachers, when they use these books, they start the unit and they simply say, ah, unit opener, ah, you know, what is this for? Boring. And they jump straight into the activities, right? And they don't get students contextualized, right? And, and, and that's one thing that I wanted to emphasize on this. So that was really, really cool. All right, let's continue with the presentation. Flashcards. Now, people tell me, James, uh, again, flashcards. Yes, flashcards, especially with children, they work. Just like I, I, I talked about, you know, um, using props uh, on one of my previous webinars, I think it was the one on July 4th. And, and my friends were rolling, you know, laughing at me. If any of you saw that webinar, it was hilarious because I got a little puppet called monkey and I got a little puppet called dog, you know, and they're talking to each other. It's like, hi, monkey, hi, dog. Hello, everybody. And, and, you know, it's all like me, but again, with little children, you can actually um, start conversations like that, get them to relax, you know. Flashcards work the same way. Kids and even with adults, depending on the flashcards. With flashcards, you can actually develop, you know, fluency just like we did with that illustration, depending on which flashcards you're going to use. Okay. You can have flashcards that have two equal images with subtle differences. And you can have students discuss what those differences are. Why are those differences there? So do not underestimate the power of, uh, of classics. Now, you can use online flashcards, which you can simply Google, and there's a plethora. I mean, there's a cornucopia of, of, of resources out there. Or you can simply use your physical flashcards and hold them up to the screen. You know, I use all kinds of stuff. Uh, I, I will I will grab whatever you know I have at hand that my kid left on my desk, like my little friendly speaker here, you know, <laughs> to develop vocabulary. Why is his mouth so big? Well, well what are, why is his eyes so wide open? I mean, why is he blue? Is he from out of earth or something like that? You know, I mean, use your imagination, especially with kids, you know, to get them engaged. Or my, my good friend here, Homer, who I identify with Penny. You know, he's married, he's fat, he's got a little kid that's driving him crazy, which would be my three-year-old, you know, a terrible tree. I'm surprised he hasn't shown up here, you know. He's dead asleep, thank God. Uh, by the way, if you seem to, happens that, that, that you see this really cute face show up here and say, hi, hello, you know, and start putting his face on the camera, then you're warned. So, I mean, do not underestimate the power of the classics that we use in the actual classroom. Everything works. I mean, just get them talking. You need to get your students talking to get them, you know, I mean, comfortable. And about error correction, we'll, we'll see towards the end of the presentation because that's in your mind right now. Yeah, get them talking about what else, James? Everything you do in your normal classes, okay? Oh, this is one of my favorite ones. We tell the story. We tell the story. It's an activity with uh, maybe lower intermediate all the way up to advanced students in which it's, it's a very simple activity. You can have a story online and you can have them read it, yes? And after they all read it, uh, whether it's a children's story or if you're working with adults and you're reading you know, an article from Harvard Business Review, again, being assertive, we spoke about this uh, last webinar about how to select listening materials, remember? Same thing. Listening, reading materials are needed to develop fluency, okay? So 
maybe you can have, you know, for children or for teenagers, uh, some amusing story. They can read it or they can listen to it. And then you say, well, all right, uh, Karen, I want you to retell the story, but I want you to use only one and a half minutes. And then, you know, I like to put a big timer, you know, right on the screen, add to the pressure, but it gets them all excited. It's like, <laughs> all you have to do is Google it and say, you know, online timer. All right, begin. And then, well, uh, story is about beep, beep, beep. Get him, gets him excited. Okay, so when she finished retelling the story, then I'll go, well, Natalie, do you think you could retell that story for me, but only one minute? One minute, yes. I mean, simplify it. Okay, I'll give it a try. Okay, it was a little kid, and this and that, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And then when she finished, I said, okay, Michelle, I got a challenge for you. Can you retell this story in 30 seconds? And Michelle will go into Gilmore Girl, you know, mode. And, okay, so a little, 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 little. So students are smiling. They're engaged. We're not even doing the activity. And I see some of you guys is, uh, smiling a lot because it's fun. And, and, and since you're being entertained and, 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 and you're having, you know, a little bit of fun here, right? Then it gets them less aware or less conscious about their pronunciation. They go more fluent and they don't worry so much about what they're saying. Now they're worried more about, you know, I mean, the activity itself. Uh, another version of retail story is what I call collective storytelling. So I'm going to ask Gina to unmute herself. Can you do that for me, Gina? Gina Severo? It, only if you want. Okay. Sydney, can you jump in with us? Galen, is that the correct way to pronounce your name? Yes. All right, yeah. All right, and let's see. I'm trying to get people who are, uh, who have activated the okay. camera, but, uh, okay, let's, what about, uh, let's see, Francisco, Francisco Vera, are you with us? Can you unmute yourself? You don't have to activate your camera, just unmute yourself. All right, so the activity is very simple. I'm gonna start telling a story, and at some point of the story, I'm gonna finish, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna say, end. And then I'm going to ask one of you guys to continue telling the story as if you were telling the story. Do you understand? Okay. Yes? Yeah. All right. So, Samantha, we're going to go in this order. I'm going to start with you. And the rule is, the rule of thumb is that you're only going to speak for about 10 or 15 seconds. And you say, end. And then I'll say, Sydney. And then Sydney continues and so on and so after. Okay? So, I'm going to start. Something really strange happened to me last night. I was coming home and it was a beautiful night. So I decided to park my car and, you know, take a walk on the park. As I was walking through the park, all of a sudden, a gust of wind began blowing. I felt chills going down my spine. I felt that weird sensation that something or someone was watching me. I heard the loud noise. I turned around, and then, Samantha, Samantha, and then what happened? I don't know, not Samantha. Okay, I can sorry, say. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, Gina, Gina, Gina. Gina. Okay, Gina. And, and then I saw this strange creature coming out of the dark, going towards me with this strange noise, with the strange noise, and I didn't know what to do. So I ran, I ran, and I ran. And while I was running, I hit this huge rock. And it happens that it wasn't a rock. It was a strange thing. And, Sydney? And um, the strange thing <laughs> growled at me and came towards me and... Uh, it started to glow in the dark, oh, yeah. and I saw that it had large claws and big fangs. And oh my God! And Galen, and the big thing then decided to jump into the air with green flashing eyes and a red flashing tail and took off into the night, flapping its large wings and breathing out sparkles, green flashing sparks. And then what happened? And then what happened? Francisco, are you there? Uh, no? Okay. 
Who wants to jump in? Who wants Here. to jump in? Here. Yes, you are? Okay, Francisco. And then what happened? No? Okay. So, um, uh, yes, go on, go on. Are you listening? So I'm starting to play something totally to try to be afraid. And I can hear me well. Oh, don't worry, Francisco. So, because you're scared and you're running and you're, yeah, <laughs> and you're panting. so scary. I'm no. so really want to, to call someone to help me, but I found my, my cell phone and I'm in my hands and I don't know what exactly to do. And then what happened, Karen? Karen jumped in there. What happened? You didn't know what to do. Yes, you, you. No, you don't want to. Okay, okay, Johan, you want to jump in there? No, okay, Natalie, Natalie, go ahead. Natalie, Natalie wants to jump in. And then I woke up. <laughs> ah, <laughs> you killed me. You killed me. That's exactly what I was going to say. That was so awesome. All right, so did you guys enjoy that? Yeah. That was really cool. So, and, and, and God, um, the cool thing is that you never know what students are going to come up with. You know what I mean? So, so we had a green thing with flashy eyes and <laughs> we had, I mean, it was really fun. So these are the things that, that if you notice, it is an online activity, but I'm observing you. Yes. And then, then you'll have students that will say, no, no, I don't want to. Don't force the students. Don't force the students to jump in. And then you will have somebody like Natalie that will raise their hands and, oh, I want to, I want to. And then, you know, let them go with the flow. Never force anything upon students because then you're going to create total rejection towards your class and total rejection towards the activities. So this is like one of my favorite, favorite variations, which is retell the story, okay? Breaking news. Uh, with intermediate or upper intermediate or advanced students, especially, you know what, with um, primary school kids, this is really cool because primary school kids like to take on roles. So breaking the news is you can give them some mild news or something amusing that happened. You know, that there's always some sort of a amusing news flash or something hilarious that happened somewhere, or you don't want to get it too serious. And then you can ask your students, maybe put them into groups and tell them, okay, guys, so we're going to have a news broadcast. I'm going to pick you up into rooms right now. One of you guys is going to be the producer, one of you guys is going to be the writer, and one of you guys is going to be the anchor man or the anchor woman, right? And you go on to tell us the news. And then you want to model for them. So in today's news, news flash, do not go near the park. We just got a report from various citizens that there was a green thing with flashy eyes jumping up and growling at a gentleman called Sydney, right? And uh, although, uh, yes, what do we have here? Oh, we have a latest report that uh, it was just a dream. Uh, thank you, Natalie. And now to our correspondent. <laughs> so this is the kind of stuff where you wanted to use the props also. Uh, I don't know if you were with me on the July the 4th webinar where, you know, I pulled out a microphone. I'm not in my office right now, so I don't have, you know, all my props. And basically, you know, I, I would have the microphone in. And back to you, Galen. And then, you know, put the microphone on Galen's face. And then, you know, I'm in. And then get everybody smiling. Galen's smiling. He's like, whoa, you put me on the spot. All right, that's fun. Okay. Again, that's what it's all about. You know, also the energy that you project, right? That's very fundamental. That's very important, right? Okay. Role plays. Online role plays. Uh, the best role plays for me are the ones where students have no idea, no idea whatsoever, yes? what kind of task or what kind of role play you're going to assign to them. So for role plays, what I simply do is I will go to, uh, just go to Google, right? And then, you know, all you have to do is look for role play cards. Now, the best ones are where I break up my students into rooms or maybe even single rooms so they cannot hear each other. And then I go and I give each other, each one a text. So for example, what would be a cool role play? I would say, well, Gina, uh, your task is to go and visit your grandfather. 
oh, really? You don't like him too much, but you need money. You need money to go on your dream vacation. Your grandfather, you know, is loaded. He's rich. So you got to get that money from him, whatever, whichever way you can. And this is something that is related to all of us. Uh, at some point in our lives, you know, getting money from a relative. And I would say, Galen, your granddaughter, who is a brat, you totally despise her. I mean, you hate her music. You hate the way she dresses. You hate the way she acts because she only comes to you when she's asking for money. He's going to come and ask you for something. And you do not want to give it to her no matter what. And then I'll go back to Dina and say, uh, Dina, you have to get that money. I don't care how you get it, but you have to get it. And then, you know, I'll connect everybody back in the main meeting and I'll say, okay, go. And then you'll be surprised at, at <laughs> the things they come up to and how they jump in there. And then you'll have other students jump in. Oh, can I be the mother? Can I be the mother? Can I intercede for Dina? Yes, go ahead. Go right in. So basically, these things you can simply Google. All right. And role play cards or role play flashcards. And then when you go to Google Images, you find a whole bunch of them, okay? And then you can download them and you have different situations. And then what you wanna do is you can either uh, basically just download the images and crop the images using paint or whatever, just you know, create the individual uh, flashcards or the individual scenarios. And then use the rooms feature, it's fundamental, it's paramount, that one student does not know what the other student has. Now, I have another one, which I like. And, and for example, for level one students, I will give them cards that say something like, uh, my name is Mario Rodriguez. I'm a professional boxer. I live in Queens. I like uh, horror movies. You know, I'm 55 years old. And then, you know, I will give another one of my students. Um, let's see, maybe... Uh, Erica, I would give her another card that says, well, my name is uh, Johanna. Yes, I am from Germany. I am a fashion designer. I am this, I am that. I'm 20 years old. And then I'll give everybody different cards. And I'll actually play music like <laughs> whatever you people listen to, according to my students, you know. I mean, if it's all folks like, like me, I'll probably play some classics, you know. If it's like new kids, then I don't know, I'll play, even though I despise it, uh, Justin Bieber or something like that. I don't know what, what young kids listen to. Yeah, I know, Karen, I, 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 I do the same face. You know, students say, can we listen to Justin? Oh my God, I'm heartbroken. Justin is getting married. I'm like, oh God, uh, uh, excuse me while I go to the bathroom and I barf. But of course you have to play the role and smile and whatever. And then I'll say, okay, the, the all of the game is very simple. Go back to the rooms and I, I'll put them in individual rooms and you're in a party, you're listening to music, you're introducing yourself to other people. And this is the question, like, well, what is your name? Where are you from? What do you do? What are your favorite things, et cetera, et cetera, right? Again, play with these things. And then I'll have like a, like a main activity, like a game maybe, where I'll ask uh, Fatima and I'll say, Fatima, can you describe one person that you met today? And I'll make sure that everybody interacts with everybody at some point, okay? And Fatima, can you tell us about somebody that you met today, but do not say the gender, do not say the name, just tell us what this person likes, where this person is from, what this person does, and the rest of you, try to guess who this person is. Simple enough, you know, straightforward activity. And again, play with the flashcards depending yes, on the level that you have. Descriptions, right? Uh, my name is this, I am like this, I am like that. Again, use your imagination. It's not that hard. Don't be afraid to ex experiment. Don't be afraid to explore different options, right? Current events presentation, it's similar to the news with one difference. Uh, especially with older students, a lot of them will have to do presentations at their job, right? Even as teachers, sometimes we have to present to other teachers, like what I'm doing right here, right now. So it's actually fun if you can get them engaged, right? And tell them, okay, uh, so let's try to do a presentation uh, based on this project that you're working on, you know, at your job. Yes, this is something that you would normally do on your, your native language, but depending on the level, you can have them, you know, show you what they do, uh, show you, um, stuff about their current life or basically just tell you about some sort of current event 
that they find interesting. This is different from the news. This is something that they find interesting, not necessarily news. Like for example, uh, the Kardashian's father had a sex change. I don't know, whatever, right? That whatever people find interesting. The important thing is that to get students speaking, you need to get them engaged, engaged of whatever they're interested on. You need to use the tools, okay? Making predictions, simple activity. Asking students, well, what do you think is gonna happen after the virus is gone? How are your classes going to be? Uh, you're going to online classes right now. Where do you see yourself in 20 years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Again, pretty straightforward. But most importantly, let's jump now into correction because you know I, I, I got a little bit carried away here today with the activities. And how do you correct students when they make mistakes, okay? There's a wrong way and there's a right way. One way, or the way I like to call it, is to correct every single mistake that they make. So the student says, eh, eh, this is one activity, the, the, the signet, no, 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 look at me, design, design. I'm exaggerating, of course, okay? But even if for you, I mean, very kindly and very nicely, you say, no, 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 Natalie, repeat after me, design, design, okay? This is what the student is going to see. Ready? No, no, you stupid, Natalie, designed, designed. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but you need to understand that students are anxious. They don't like to be put on the spot, okay? And perception is very important. And I know I exaggerated, but that's how a student perceives it, and they simply just go, hmm. I don't think I want to participate anymore, you know? And you'll lose them. Another thing, even if you're nice about correcting, uh, teacher, this is one activity designed, uh, no, uh, designed. Okay, teacher, uh, to, to work uh, on fluency, uh, stop, fluency. Okay, uh, the a student, oh, no, 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 not, not a student, S student. What happens at this point? They don't want to read anymore. You're correcting every single thing. And, and I know they taught us, you know, oh, you need to correct students. Let's try a different approach. Uh, this is one activity, a uh, designant to work on fluency. Excellent, very good, Galen. So this is one activity designed to work on fluency, right? Okay, Natalie, can you repeat now? Uh, yes, James, uh, this is one activity designed uh, to work on fluency. Excellent, this is one activity designed to work on fluency. How are you getting it? Sydney, can you read that? Uh, yeah, this is one activity designed uh, to work on fluency. Nice, good job. Let's go back to Gina. Gina, can you read it again? I don't remember what the first one was, I lost track. Um, uh, yes, at this point, what happens in Gina's head? She heard it again and again and again, and metacognition kicks in. And she selves correct. So, there are two ways, like I said. The wrong way, which is the deductive approach, and the right way, which is the inductive approach. You read about this on your TEFL courses, but just to go, I mean, very quickly. Inductive is when I correct, I mean, deductive is when I correct, you know, every single little thing, and then I show the formula, and I explain everything, and I'm, I'm on top of the student correcting, correcting. Inductive, is when the student figures it out. And that's why interaction is so fundamental and so paramount. So if I have a conversation uh, in which I have weak students and strong students, right? And let's take a look at uh, one of the many, I mean, conversations that we can find in a book. And then I have the first students, give me a second. Let's zoom in here. Then I have a student A and a student B say, uh, student A is very strong. Uh, guess what? I'm going to spend a month in Mexico City. That's uh, great. Uh, what are you doing to, to do there? Um, I'm going to work in my company and so on. You get the point. Then I switch the students to interact with another student. So the weaker student 
starts listening, you know, to the correct pronunciation from other students, and then very, in a very unconscious way, begins to self-correct him or herself. That's the importance of the rooms. Uh, you don't want to go either on the classic one. Okay, now, Galen and Sydney. Okay, very good, Galen and Sydney. Now, uh, Erica and Carmen. Okay, now, Lindy and Blake. Because they're going to be self-conscious. Because now everybody's listening to them. But if you put them in rooms and you have them, you know, practice the conversations amongst each other and you basically jump from room to room, basically observing, maybe you see a student that needs more intervention, you jump in there and say, okay, okay, Sydney, now you and I. And then you help them a little bit. That's how you create fluency and you don't hurt students' confidence and you don't hurt the process. And then the more exposure and the more, the more practice you have, that's the key. The key is student-centered classroom. And this is why, you know, this room splitting, you know, I mean, feature is so important. Now, if you're only working with two students, then it's cool. You don't need to go through all of that. But the important thing is that if you are going to correct your students, please, please be nice. <laughs> I mean, they're going through, we have to be rigorous, yes. And we want our students to speak properly but not at the cost of intimidating them or creating, you know, a situation which is going to be really hard. And some of the older guys, and I used to be one of those, I used to actually say that and say, well, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. They want to learn English, it's got a custom. I'm a Marine, you know, I mean, I'm, I served seven years in the Marine Corps, <laughs> a gunnery sergeant, and I was a drill sergeant. So you can imagine where I'm coming from. And, and it must be terrifying for you thinking, oh my God, and this guy teaches kids? <laughs> We're not that bad, you know what I mean? Um, the important thing is that you get out of that mentality. You need to remember, the same way that maybe some of you at some point when you were doing your TEFL certifications felt a little bit frustrated because your trainer was a little bit harsh on you, on your class plan. And I tell my trainers all the time, I say, look, these are inexperienced teachers. So you have to be coherent. They, they don't have your level of knowledge. So... Be nice in the feedback that you give them. Focus on the positive things. Otherwise, they get discouraged. They probably spend, you know, two, three nights, you know, putting this lesson plan together and you're destroying it for them and you're destroying their self-confidence. The same way that some of you felt when you received that lesson plan and said, what the? Beep. Can't say it, of course. I mean, we're in public here. Transfer that feeling towards your students. You see where I'm going with this? Uh, many a times what I'll do is I'll, I'll have a training session with my teachers and then I'll just hit them, you know, boom, okay. What are the five features of communicative approach? Uh, you can't? Well, we saw that already. What is wrong with you? Well, the same thing happens when you try to teach your students 100 vocabulary words per day or, or when you're too harsh. Be demanding, be nice, and correct the right way, not the wrong way, okay? Because if you correct the right way, the wrong way, that's what you get right there. That's your student right there. When you're frustrating them, when you overcorrect them, when you focus only on the negative aspects. And this is the student, when you do it the right way, when you paraphrase, when you basically use the, the, the concept of scaffolding. The concept of scaffolding is when you help your kid learn to ride a bicycle, right? You gotta hold them and let them go little by little. You gotta be patient. But the wrong way, which is the way they taught me, where my older brother just put me on top of a hill and tossed me down the hill. You know, and, and I had some very close encounters with the pavement. It was almost like a romance with the pavement. And basically up to this day, I'm still nervous when I ride a bicycle. You know? uh, these things stick to your head. All right? So, that being said, 10.02, time for the questions. Let's... Uh, Get back to the main presentation, the main conversation. And you may now unmute yourselves and let's get started. Who wants to go first? Hello, it's Blake. I have a question. Hello, Blake. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I, my question revolves around what are some effective methods of giving praise after the listening activity? This is an activity of giving praise. Um, well, you mean when you elicit uh, answers? Mm, more so 
if the student has responded to the listening activity and they've shared what they could hear or what they could see, how can the teacher uh, reward them or to acknowledge that they have done a correct job? Well, if we're talking about little children, what I like to use is I like to use little stickers or emojis, or you okay. got a star, excellent job, or a happy face. Uh, with older students, you, it's as simple as being spontaneous, but the important thing is that do not be fake. Uh, in other words, do not overdo it either. Uh, do it very naturally. Like when I said, hey, great job, Samantha. You know, I mean, that, that was, whoa, the, the way that you close that, that, that the story, and it's something that you're not being condescendent. You're not being fake. Sorry, it was Natalie, the one that, that, that closed the story with the dream. You need to be spontaneous and you need to be honest. And do not go like, yeah, good job, uh, like, excellent. And do not go like, yeah, fantastic, you know, wow, wow, you got it, I'm so surprised. No, see, Blake, that's very good, man. I see you're improving, wow. So remember, Blake, uh, about two or three weeks ago when you started fast and you were frustrated because you couldn't understand anything from the listening? That's so cool, man. Congratulations, you're making excellent progress. So you actually now getting to understand the main idea and you're not translating so much anymore. You're not focusing so much. Great job, man. It's that simple. Okay. okay. Little children, the little plush toy, the little star, the little heart. You want a heart? Excellent, kid. Smile a lot, all right? Smiling, but not a fake smile. Don't go like this, like uh, Terminator, you know, when they're, when John Connors is teaching him how to smile, he goes, nice to meet you. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I am smiling. That's so disturbing. <laughs> I mean, the important thing is that have fun when you're doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. If you notice, if you come to all of my webinars, you'll notice that I'm always smiling and I'm always laughing. Why? Because I get a blast out of doing this. If I didn't, I would simply ask one of my trainers or one of my staff to do this thing. People ask me, why do you do these things? You have a staff. Well, because I love doing this stuff. I love talking to teachers around the world. I love teaching classes. If you don't enjoy uh, teaching kids, don't teach kids. If you don't enjoy working with older people, don't work with older people. It's a huge market out there, all right? Find your niche. And then these things will come out of you very spontaneously, yes? I can see Natalie or Karen, you know, very, being very uh, kind with the child and, and very sweet, you know, and, and, and maybe you have like this personality. Can you imagine me, you know, working with an eight-year-old kid? Very good, and me. <laughs> That's creepy. <laughs> so, again, uh, does that answer your question, Mike? Yes, it does. Those are great suggestions. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, who wants to go next? Samantha. Um, I, I, I have been doing some online classes with some Russian students and uh, uh, the language school there always insisted that they read out loud. No, um, you know, silent reading at all. They they must always, that, that was how they did it. They always read out loud. Um, and I, you know, my initial reaction, unless the student was advanced, was, um, you know, am, am I not putting the student on the spot? Um, you know, because if, if they don't get words right or, or something, you know, like you suggested, um, now if a student doesn't want to, doesn't want to speak, um, you know, don't force them. That wasn't an option um, with the Russian, with the Russian school. If you pointed out a student, that's it. They did it. Um, and I must admit, I found that approach quite harsh. Well, you need to understand that Russia comes from the Soviet bloc and they come from this, you know, mentality of rigorosity and discipline, this and that. It's like teaching, you know, Korean kids. Uh, this is not the ideal scenario, but if you're working for this company and uh, those are the, the, the requirements, then you have two choices. You adapt yeah. to those requirements, which you're going to hate. I would hate that. I, I, I would not. I mean, only if I absolutely needed to work for a company like that, I would work for them. Or I would go elsewhere and, and I, I would feel terrible about those kids because what you're saying, yes, it's, it's paramount. Uh, silent reading is fundamental to develop, you know, higher order thinking skills. 
and, and to get students engaged. And then uh, the way that the ideal way for me is let's read silently and then let's discuss what we read. You know? Yes, that's and, and the, that, activities. That um, yeah, one activity that I forgot to basically teach you today is one that I love in which I have students that are going to read, let's say, a short story. And then I put them in five groups. And then I'll assign five different pieces of the story to each group. They cannot see the other parts of the song. And then after they finish reading their correspondent, you know, parts of the stories, I'll have them interact and try to figure out what was on the other four parts of the stories. Like, so how did the story begin? And then what happened after? Who read part two? Who read part three, you know? And then I'll have like a little trivia game, maybe like a hood or something like that. Or even have the teams ask questions about the section that they read to the teams that haven't read the, the, the section. Sure. And they'll have to answer based on the interaction that they had, you know, with the other kids. That's the way to go. Uh, Russia, well, you need to understand. Uh, they're capitalists, they, even though they call themselves communists. But there's a lot of the, 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 the former Soviet Union um, mentality that is still there, and this very archaic and traditional way of thinking. Uh, yeah, I found them quite distrustful of the students. They were like, they must read out loud so that we can know that they're not um, playing on their phones or, or doing something else. I was like, wow, you know, the students are there. <laughs> but and it's, yes, it's terrible. It's terrible because students are not gaining vocabulary. They're not gaining fluency. They're doing this mechanical act of torture where, where they're basically being humiliated or they're being chastised in front of, of, of the other kids. And with teenagers, it's especially terrible. And mm. you, you need to understand that these educational systems are based on the traditional educational system, which in itself was conceived and created based on the necessities of the Industrial Revolution. Especially during the, the 20th century, when, when Russia is going through the same uh, processes as, as China, only that they're, I mean, further ahead with the Bolshevik Revolution, you need to educate obedient citizens who you can humiliate, scream at, destroy their will, and then basically will follow orders and, and basically stand up, sit down, uh, very Skinner and Watson, very conductive, yes? And this is something that unfortunately is still going on in a lot of parts of the world. I, I taught at a school in South America and they talked about 21st century pedagogy and they talked about, you know, I mean, oh, you know, I mean, uh, advanced ed education, this and that, so I said, okay, I'm gonna teach Beowulf. Beowulf, yeah, and I'm gonna teach it in Middle English. How are you going to do it? I said, don't worry. I spent the first two months going through, I mean, the genealogy and going through the historical aspect. And I had them watch the movie first and I had them get engaged. And then in addition to the final project, which was going to be an essay, I said, well, how many of you guys like boats? Three kids went like this. I said, okay, so your final project is going to make a representation of a Viking boat, a Dracar. So you can do it, uh, you know, Using uh, Minecraft, you can do it physically. I mean, you can do a model. And then your final paper is going to be on how the technology helped them change the face of civilization and create all these new routes and all these new cultures. Um, all like fashion, some girls were like this. You guys are going to do a fashion show for me with all the clothes that were representative and jewels of the era, you know, that we see in the book and what values those clothes represented. And then you're going to do a contrast with clothes that we wear today and what values they represent to us today. A kid say, oh, oh, can I do the weapons? Of course you can do a representation of the weapons, but you need to write an essay for me, you know, and then a presentation tell me how these weapons represented the bling bling, the status, just like today, you know, our cell phone represents us, just like you kids, you know, you want to have the latest cell phone, the latest clothes, the latest sneakers. How is that related to the weapons that these guys carried? Because weapons, you know, I mean, carried forth, uh, you know, prestige, and so on and so on. And the project was so fantastic. And then I got called into the principal's office because the teachers were upset because my class was not rigorous. It's, that's not academic. James has him doing little models and doing stupid little things. How is that, you know? And sorry that I'm overextending myself, but this is something that you're going to face continuously. You're going to face an archaic system with teachers who have a very, very ancient archaic you know, way of thinking. You're going to find a lot of resistance, but that's when our character comes in. And, and, and I basically smiled and I said, well, I think that your opinions are, are very interesting. I'm sorry that teachers feel uncomfortable, but this is 21st century pedagogy and there is foundation on what I'm doing. 
And if you feel comfortable, you know, with this, then thank you very much and have a nice day. And I left. And that's why now I train teachers. Because that's how we create the paradigm shift. That's why how we're going to, re I mean, revolve, you know, from its very foundation, how education has to be perceived. Education has to be something enjoyable. It has to be something fun. It has to be something meaningful. It has something relatable to our real lives. And that's how we get students speaking and we get them engaged and we get them happy and we get them excited. Uh, don't be afraid to be crazy. Back in my days as a high school teacher, I had to teach the Iroquois Constitution in American literature. And my students showed up you know, to the classroom and they're like, where's, where's James? Where's Mr. Bonilla? And I left a big sign on the board that said, Meet me in the backyard. <clears throat> so they went, they went over there. I'm standing on top of this tree. We have this big tree, you know, big branches. I'm wearing a pinnacle. I'm wearing war paint. I am the Kanaiwa, and this is the tree of the four nations, the Navajo, the Iroquois. And my students were like, wow, <laughs> join me. Join me. Climb the tree. Let us discuss this new constitution for our great nations. And I'm like, the kids were, I mean, having a ball. So don't be afraid. I mean, if you don't have that type of personality, that's okay. Uh, I actually taught science once, and, and, and a teacher said to me, it's impossible to teach in the skeletal system. I said, impossible? Huh? Okay. You mind if I give it a crack? Sure. So I sent a letter to the parents, asking them not to say anything to the children, explaining my plan, and got the letters back. That's very important. And I got authorization from the school. So. In the afternoon after the skids left, I went to the lab and I stole the skeleton and I pulled it apart and I buried the damn thing all over the school. <laughs> and the next day I told the kids, these were ninth graders, I had lab coats and I had, you know, protected those. I said, okay guys, we're going CSI today. CSI, yeah, crime scene investigation. I recently found out that a body was buried here about 50 years ago. And I have a clue of where the bones might be. You guys want to go for it? They were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have kids, you know, with birth up to their noses, you know, digging all over the school. Of course, we had to repair the damage afterwards. I, 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 I made sure that I chose, you know, locations that didn't damage the landscape. And they're bringing bones back. And, okay, guys, so we need to put these things together. I mean, where's the skull? Right here. Okay, where's the ribs? Right here. All right, the spinal cord? Right here. And lo and behold, those kids learned the, the skeletal system and never forgot it in their lives. So you see where I'm going with this, right? Yes. Don't be afraid to be innovative. Don't be afraid to have fun with your kids. Of course, online, I can't bury a skeleton, but I'll find activities like web quests that we discussed before, you know, on, on, on our previous webinars, where you can have students, you know, use the resources online. The important thing is like make them the protagonist of the learning process, and then you'll have them talking like parrots. Then it'll be a problem to get them to shut up. And that's what we want. That's, um, as teachers, you know, that's the most anguishing thing. How do I get students to speak? Well, don't force them. You think those poor Russian kids want to read a book out loud? Probably a book that, that I don't know, Dr. Shivago, whatever, <laughs> that they're engaged, that they don't like. Now, if you have them read, you know, I mean, Lord of the Rings or maybe, you know, Harry Potter or something that they might be engaged in, they might even do it, you know, willingly and happily. Read it quietly and then tell us about this book that you read. Tell us about this thing that you like so much. So, Samantha, I'm sorry that I extended myself so much on, on this response, and I apologize to the rest of you. And my boss even told me one day, you know, says, James, you know, why do you extend yourself so much when you answer these questions? Because I'm passionate about this, and, and, and I have to give a proper response. So I, I need you. you guys to bear with me, all right? You're welcome. <laughs> all right. Who wants to go now? Who wants to ask a question? Yes, Natalie, please. Thanks, James. Another um, a very nice um, session with you today. Um, my question is around the, um, the correcting of students. Um, yes. And um, uh, okay, so, so first of all, I'm a woman. Um, oh. But second of all, I'm also South African. Um, and are there kind of universal rules um, on etiquette and correcting in different cultures. Um, so I know in South Africa, we've got, I mean, a plethora of cultures and it's, you know, very rude if women behave like that or men behave like that, etc. And if, I mean, are there kind of general rules um, when it comes to correcting people that we should uh, stay away from? 
sort of behaviors that we should stay away from? Yeah, um, but they're not universal, unfortunately. They're more of a, what, the, what the local culture is like. Um, for example, if you're working with Hispanics, Hispanics are very, I'm, I'm a Latino, so they're very informal. Yes, they tend to crack jokes. Uh, they tend to be more receptive to humor, but be careful of the humor. Don't make fun of them, for example. Don't laugh at them, laugh with them. With Koreans, you have to be more serious, more subtle. With Japanese, uh, they will expect you to correct every single thing. With Americans, uh, this communicative approach works better. With Russians, uh, they'll expect you to have a whip, I guess. So, <laughs> I know, it's terrible. Um, yeah, bad, bad boy, bad comrade, bad comrade. I'm not making fun of Russia or please, I'm not being offensive. But what I'm trying to say, it is what it is. So, Natalie, my suggestion to you is always try to stick to the, the, the non-invasive, non-intimidating way of correcting, but also research the culture. Even if Japanese people are thorough and, and they'll tell me, uh, we need you to correct us in every single thing. I'll stop the class. I will stop the class. And I'll tell them, okay, guys, let's discuss this. The reason, and that's part of communicative approach, by the way, explaining to students, remember the, the five rules of communicative approach. And one of them, number three, by uh, read on David Noonan. David Noonan, 1996, communicative approach, right? The third rule is explain to students why you're doing what you're doing. So when I bump into students that tell me, well, well, why is it that you don't use, you know, formulas to teach grammar rules? I told them, okay, I'm going to teach you how to hoop a basketball. We spoke about this before, you know, and I give them the step-by-step, -step, the, the PSIs and the Newtons of force to throw the ball. And they say, okay, can you throw the ball in? No, no, we can't exactly. That's the same work. And I will, I will explain to them the process of metacognition synapses. And I will explain to them why it's so detrimental to correct every little thing and that I am correcting them, but in a more subtle way. And they say, ah, okay, teacher, so you are correcting us. Yes, but I correct by paraphrasing. So when I paraphrase something, I need you to listen attentively so you can self-correct. If you explain these processes to students, you negotiate with them, and, and, and then you tell them why you're doing what you're doing, not just because I'm the teacher, uh, shut up, you know, it's what I say, and because I say so. I used to be one of those, by the way. Then you get much better results. Okay, does that answer your question, Natalie? Yes, thank you. Are you? Would you suggest maybe when you engage with these students um, in the first few sessions with them that you even negotiate with them how they would prefer to be corrected? Yes, of course. But not only how they would prefer to be corrected, but negotiate with them. Okay, I prefer to be corrected for every little thing. I say, okay, how about, let's do this. How about if I correct you sometimes like that? And how about if sometimes we try it my way and then we see what works best? Um, I think it was two weeks ago that we spoke about that, about working with different age groups. Remember that webinar? And I spoke about how the first sessions you need to set the rules and negotiate, you know, and, and basically construct the rules together with your students. Uh, same thing applies for rubrics, by the way. I, I never make the rubrics myself. I construct them with the students so they know exactly what is expected of them. Uh, awesome question. All right, who wants to continue? You guys are a little bit quiet today. I got 27 people here and nobody has any questions. Come on, guys. Come on, help me earn my living here. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? I hear you fine. Okay. Yeah. My question is, uh, I have some students who, who are, I call them the yes and no. Oh, okay. So I ask them a question, yes. Ask them another question, no. So, you know, and it's, it's speaking, and they're Korean, and you know I find that difficult being Hispanic. I'm a talker, so if you give me yes, no, no answers, I I get the frustration. Okay, that's a good question, Victor. We actually so I, spoke about. My question is uh, more. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, my question is what to do with with that kind of student. Do not ask close-ended questions. Let me give you an example, Victor. Victor, uh, are you Hispanic? Yes. Where are you from? I am from Puerto Rico. All right, so those are close-ended questions. Mm -hmm. I'm setting myself for that. Victor, what do you like most about Puerto Rico? Uh, the food. Why? Because uh, it's delicious. 
what do you consider delicious? Um, the best food. I think it's the best food. Yeah. Oh, you mean like sofrito and stuff like that? Yeah, sofrito is what you make some of the food with. Sofrito is not the food. It's more of a condiment. See, oh. But see, I'm a talker. You see what I'm saying? So if yes, you ask but, me a but, question like that, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep bouncing. But yeah, but whatever. let's say, okay, I want you to resist. Uh, go Korean on me now, okay? Hmm. All right, so let's go again. So, Victor, what's your favorite food? Uh, Spanish food? Uh, uh, no, no, you're the Korean kid that only wants to say yes or no. Oh, well, if I was Korean, then, would, then I would say something like kimchi or bibimbap or, you know, okay, one of those. Kimchi. Okay, kimchi. Okay, So, can you tell me what ingredients are in, in, in that platter? What was it? Bibimbap? Bibimbap. Bibimbap is... Uh, it's Remember, like you're a, Korean. You got to resist. Yeah. Don't be Victor. Be the Korean kid. Oh, be the Korean kid. Oh. Yeah. What are the ingredients? It, it has noodles. It what has else? egg. It has Good. rice. Mm. But Victor, why, why, why noodle and, and rice you know, that's, together? That's how I get, those are my, those are my answers. Yeah, and you right. mix it all together, right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you got to follow up on the question and then you push and you push and you push because if, if, if I mean, and then you get them until you, they click on something that they like to talk about. And that's the key. Rule number one, do not set yourself up with close-ended questions. Don't say, where are you from? Ask him, do you like, why do you like being a Puerto Rican? I have a lot of Puerto Rican friends, by the way. I'm very familiar with. Uh, yeah, Rican. so you know, yeah, you're in New York. Yeah, I'm in New York. I'm, uh, I live in Queens. Sure, so if you don't have a Puerto Rican friend, I don't know. It's not right. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, especially uh, the way that, that, uh, that Puerto Rican stock is, is fantastic because you're so expressive with your hands and this and that. So it's a cultural thing. Koreans, I worked with Koreans before and ask them about their ancestry, ask them about their family, ask them about their values, ask them about things like respect, uh, ask them about where do they see themselves in the future. With Koreans, this is paramount. I mean, these kids will study 10 hours in, in, in a regular classroom and then they'll go through another four or five hours in the school because they have to get the best results in this, you know, end of uh, process exams that will determine their future. So explore what they like and you'll get them talking and stay away from, you know, close-ended questions. And then just keep following, following, following. Why, why, well, tell me why, well, tell me why. Be Bar Simpson. Yes. Behave, why? Because you need to be a good kid. Why, why, do, you, why, do, you, why do I need to be a good kid? Because it's proper. Why is it proper? Because people need to get along. Why do people need to get along? <laughs> so eventually they will loosen up. Catch my drift? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. You have this a lot with uh, Chinese, Koreans, Vietnamese, and uh, with Koreans especially. All right, who wants to ask uh, Lindy? Yes, um, I want to know about correcting people when there's a cultural way that they speak. And, and, and it's like, if they're gonna speak English and they're in their country or in a mixed culture, uh, and they're gonna say words that we pronounce differently in our country, but in their country, those words actually are, are the way people say English words. Do we try to get them, like Africa, when I lived in Ghana a little bit, they have a way they speak English and they are not going to probably shift to an American accent with American derivatives of words. <laughs> They're going to, you know, pretty much stay inside of their cultural pronunciations of words and uses. It's, is their discourse intelligible? Yeah, even if they pronounce it their way, can you understand what they're saying? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, do uh, you remember the saying that we say, well, you say potato, I say potato, you say tomato, I say tomato. So it's a mixture of both. You don't want to force it into them. Uh, if this is the context in which they're going to use the language, maybe I am a professor from India and I speak like this and this is perfectly understandable. Or maybe I am Colombian, pues, and I like to speak like that. Or no, there's no um, a stronger Colombian accent. Hola, my friend. What you need to understand, Lindy, is that in Colombia we speak like this, yes? <laughs> or maybe, I mean, you're in a, in a different country, so that's perfectly fine. You need to understand that one of the, the paradigm shifts or one of the changes that we have to make in the paradigm is that 
People don't have to speak American. People don't have to speak British. I'm from New York, but I'm Colombian. You can tell a mile away from my accent that, you know, I'm not a, from Carolina and I'm not a native, 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 native you know, English speaker, although I was born here in New York, but I have very strong, you know, Latino uh, roots. Most of my friends are either Puerto Rican or Colombian. If you're a Victor, you know, he has this very uh, New York, New Yorkian accent, and that's perfect English. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Oh, Connecticut. Yeah. But but you sound but you sound a little bit New Yorkian, man. Yeah, well, we were close. We were only an hour, maybe an hour and a half away from Manhattan. So. Oh well, 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 no, no, no offense intended. That was the I'm hangout just... when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, there you go. So I mean, you see what I'm saying? So. Does that mean that that his English is bad because he doesn't he doesn't speak you know properly? Um, I had a person in a call center once um, speaking to an American, and, and he says, uh, "Yes, hello, uh, my name is Michael. May I help you?" Uh, excuse me, where are you from? Uh, I am Colombian. Uh, how can how can I how can I be of help, Miss? I'm, you're Mexican? No, I need somebody who speaks English, please. Uh, I need somebody from America. Lady, uh, I am from America. Technically, Colombia is part of the American continent. Don't compare yourself to us. America is a country. You ignore a fool. Let me speak to your manager. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a cultural thing. Um, sometimes they'll say, well, this teacher doesn't speak good English because he's got a strong South African accent. No? Australian accent. Right. It is a plethora. And, and it's not only the accent per se. It's, it's whether that word whatever the word is, is, is comprehensible. And, yes, um, and, I mean, and yeah. also I think probably what they're using English for, right? I mean, like you talk about telephone English, they need to have a really ratcheted up level of pronunciation in order to get that across the phone. I mean, you should hear my mother talk about people she has to talk to from the phone company who live in India. <laughs> Well, it has to do. It has to do. Yeah, yeah, I know. It has to do with what the purpose of learning the language is. If the purpose of learning the language is to interact with their own culture, and if you're in England, then forget about French fries. You're, you're going to have to talk about, you know, fish and chips, right? And the flat, and, and the lift, and the pint of ale. So, again, but if this person is learning English because they need to work at a call center and, and they need to interact with Americans per se then you need to make them aware of this and say, okay, guys, I understand that here in Colombia, you know, you say ganja and I shouldn't have used that word. I just remember that ganja is something else. Oh, I was trying to go Cajun. Yeah, I know. Everybody's laughing. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to get fired for this. All right. So <clears throat> you get my point. And I just get red and I'm red. All right, cool. <laughs> well, well, good morning. <laughs> That's a good I'm way to end it, the webinar. So, I'm if they, I'm they say, you know, in, in a certain oh, way in their I culture, see. that's fine, let it be. But if these guys, you know, are learning English because they need to interact with outside cultures, then you need to make them aware of that. Like we just said, explain to students the why. So, okay, cool. I mean, use it in your own culture, but, you know, Americans don't understand too well when you talk about, you know, the whatchamacallit. Just came to my mind this candy bar that used to be whatchamacallit. People oh. say, what are you eating? I'm, I'm eating a whatchamacallit. Yeah, but what is it? A whatchamacallit. <laughs> but yeah, but what exactly are you eating? It's a whatchamacallit. Again, it's a cultural thing. And okay. it has to do with Thanks. your, uh, you know what I recommend you should read? Read up on Dean Cummins from the University of Toronto. And he's done a lot of work in something called Sense of Audience. Say the name and title again, please. J-I-M, Juliet, India, Mike. Jim, and actually he has your same last name. Yeah, Cummings, yeah. Yeah, oh, how, how convenient. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> that was easy, yeah. And what was the name of the book? Uh, he has several books, but what you want to look up is Authentic Audience and Jim Cummings, and you'll find a lot of uh, papers on that. Okay, thank you. Not a problem. All right, so I guess we have time for a couple of more questions. I always hate to end the sessions, but... Well, hello. Yes, Good hello. Morning. Can you speak a little louder, uh, Gargi? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, I was actually listening to your um, conversation with, uh, with uh, Miss Cummings, and I was, I'm from India, well, 
<laughs> I'm nice sorry. To you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be offensive in any way. No, 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 no. It's not, uh, no. I would say that that must be a language variation, like mm -hmm. um, the way people talk and the way people are listening to, uh, listening to like the uh, well. It might be a teacher and a student, or um, I think that the way um, that is received pronunciation, um, right? Like I don't think that it's um, actually wrong uh, or incorrect to speak in that way but like to understand if we understand the context i think that we are good to go right yes that's that's well my point with imitating the indian accent that's why i said an indian professor yeah. because i had an indian professor and he was that's awesome right. and my point my, my 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 whole point is basically what you're saying is that we have a right to have our accent it's part of our culture exactly. mm -hmm. we need to learn english we don't need to learn to be american or british exactly that's so what whether, I, that's what i was like thinking and like, i have been listening to all your session and it was it's like really nice and i have been listening to all of um the people who are here like the participants who are here and i I'm, I'm basic basically i'm here in ecuador and it's nice to like uh, hear from you. Like you are from Colombia, you said. Yeah, so, uh, my parents are Colombian. I'm from New York. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm teaching here. Well, it's um, actually uh, I feel uh, like pleasure to talk to you and um, to all of you, like saying hello to everyone, to greet everyone. Thank you so much. Well, well thank I'm you. Yes, go ahead, Cardi. Continue. Yeah, I also wanted to say, like, uh, in India, basically, I'm from the eastern part of India. Okay. So the southern uh, part of India, like, there, people speak in a very different way. Sometimes it's even, like, you know, um, impossible for us to get, like, what they are trying to say or, uh, like, their pronunciation. But we don't say it wrong, like, in our culture, I mean, the Indian culture. Like, we have different kinds of pronunciation in different parts of india well it's it's it happens even in spanish or in other languages it's, it's yeah. basically a matter of asking for clarification uh, ecuadorian people would be like um, it's, uh, excuse me sir can you please tell me how to get to quito and, um, and this is the yeah. way that i speak you know they have like that kind of accent and then if you go to <laughs> down down below to Argentina, they'll be like, Che, boludo. well, like, you know, like, I come from Argentina, and I don't understand what you're saying. Can you please repeat yourself? <laughs> uh, and then yeah. you go up to, um, to North and maybe um, Medellin, Colombia, he's like, hey, I'm Maria, my friend. What are you saying to me today, pues? I'm trying to understand what you're saying, you know? Wow. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a language, I wouldn't say a language barrier. I would say a, a, a wonderful opportunity for pluriculturality. So exactly. when you speak to another English speaker and, and you have a problem with their expressions, then ask them to clarify. Oh, well, that's interesting. What yeah. is that again? <laughs> you know, this is the way that we say it. Uh, can you tell me again how you say it? And that's how you enrich yourself linguistically. You, you need to remember that language is a living, breathing, evolving thing. And it evolves depending on which culture you're in. That's, that's why English is so complex. You know, only 17% of English is actual English. The rest comes from the Vikings and then the expansion of the British Empire and what they brought yeah. back. You're from India and you have a touch of a British accent. Why? Because yeah. of the colonial times. And, and that's yeah. the case with us. So yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for that intervention. I totally agree. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, so Ardi. And you're welcome to come back. We're here every single week. Uh, rain yeah, rain sure. or shine. I mean, we're here. Uh, for the first time that I'm here in your meeting. And it's, well, I'm really pleased. <laughs> Thank you so we will be much. sending you guys a link, all of you and everybody else on the mailing list, so yeah. that you can actually uh, watch the previous webinars and you can like yes. catch up to speed. Every week, by the way, guys, to close up, because I don't want to take more of your time. I, I don't mean to be abusive. Um, <laughs> I've noticed so. that we keep getting, you know, people coming back and back and back. And that's so gratifying, especially as a teacher. Uh, because this is something voluntary and, and taking your time to spend this time with us on Saturday mornings is incredibly gratifying. So stay safe. Wish you all success in all your endeavors. And I hope to see most of you next week on our next webinar. And thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.
Thank you. Have a great day. Thank Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. guys. Thank Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.